What are nature's rights? This is, this is absolutely remarkable, absolutely fascinating. Um, a new legislation introduced in Australia. Uh, on the line with us is uh, Mari Margill, the director for the International Center for the Rights of Nature, a program of the Community Environmental Legal Defense Fund, CELDEF, C-E-L-D-F, dot org is the website, also the Twitter handle, at CELDEF. Uh, Mari, welcome to the program, or welcome back. I, I think you've been here before. Mari? Uh-oh. She is not hearing me. I don't think she's hearing me. Okay, we will come back to that in just a moment. And uh, first, I'm going to, uh, oh, wait a minute, there she is. I'm sorry, that was entirely my fault. Let's start over. Mari Margill is on. She's the director of the International Center for the Rights of Nature. Uh, celldef.org is the website. Mari, welcome. Thank you so much. Thanks for, thanks for joining us. Um, tell us about this, this legislation. What are the rights of nature and how would they be enshrined uh, with this? with this policy? This is a really important moment for Australia and for the growing movement for the rights of nature because this is the first time any kind of legislation has been introduced in the country. This is in the Western Australia Parliament mm -hmm. um, by Member of Parliament Diane Evers, and we've been working with the Australian Earth Laws Alliance for a number of years to share the rights of nature in terms of what it is, how communities and people in government can begin to put this into place in Australia to protect their very fragile ecosystems, including places in Western Australia, including things like the Great Barrier Reef, which we developed some model legislation for. This all comes from, um, you know, just decades and decades of environmental laws which regulate how we as human beings use the natural world. And the consequences have been devastating, as we see in headlines every day about the acceleration of climate change, about deaths of coral reefs, which of course has impacted the Great Barrier Reef, about species die off at unnatural rates. And all of that comes because we're working under environmental laws in Australia, in the United States, and really around the world, which are all about regulating and authorizing how human beings use nature as opposed to protecting nature. And even laws intended to protect nature specifically run into the problem that they are coming up against other environmental laws, which are intent on doing things like fracking, mining, and drilling the natural world, which are bringing these devastating impacts. Right. So, so Mari, give me an example. If, this, if, if a similar law were to pass in the United States, um, if similar principles were enshrined in our legal system, how would things be different here? So we have more than 30 laws now at the local level in the United States, which enshrine the rights of nature in local law in places like Toledo with the Lake Erie Bill of Rights, which was passed earlier this year in Pittsburgh, which passed their law in 2010 and in other communities and other states. And people are doing this because they've come up against an environmental legal system in which they found they were unable to protect the environment because the environment itself was not intended to be protected by laws which authorize things like cracking or factory farming or privatization of water systems. Those laws have a very different intention, which is to regulate human use of nature really as fast as possible. And communities have come up against those laws and they're find that those laws authorize the very things communities are trying to stop. So for instance, in 2010, when we worked with the Pittsburgh City Council, the City Council learned that drilling and fracking were going to be authorized within the city limits, including under cemeteries. They looked at state level law, federal law, which authorized fracking within the city and determined that they needed to take themselves out from under that existing conventional environmental law because it didn't provide the community the ability to stop and protect themselves from fracking. And that's where the rights of nature came in because they determined that not only did they need their own right as a community to be able to say no to these kinds of threats, but in addition, that they literally had to change how nature was treated under the law from being considered an item of commerce that we regulate our the use of to something that has an inherent intrinsic right to exist and moving it from being considered commerce or property to bearing rights itself to things like to exist and to flourish and to evolve and regenerate and be restored. I understand this uh, also em uh, embodies the, the precautionary principle 
and also recognizes the right of First Nations people, indigenous people, aboriginal people, to uh, speak on behalf of their land. Do I have that right? Yes, that Western Australia legislation does indeed do that. And what we have found um, is that this isn't not only about transforming how nature is treated under the law, so that we, you know, as Columbia's constitutional court ruled in a 2016 decision where they determined that the Atrata River possesses certain rights as a river ecosystem, and they explained their decision to recognize these rights of this natural system, that it's time for human beings to recognize that they are not a, quote, ruler of nature, but they are a part of nature. And we found that this work is really about shifting not only how the law treats nature, but how we as human beings do, so that we recognize that First Nations people have a right to decide what happens on their ancestral land, that people and communities have the right to be able to stop known threats to the environment that environmental laws are legalizing today. So that we really transform what the very purpose of law and governance is to enshrine not only the rights of nature, but the rights of people to make decisions to protect nature. 